Okay, wonderful uh, to see you all. We're continuing at our uh, snail's pace going through uh, Parshat uh, Mishpatim. And uh, I warned all of you who were here from the beginning that we would not set any records for uh, accomplishing uh, uh, large numbers of texts in a short uh, period of time. But I hope that uh, in-depth study of a text uh, is of interest to, uh, to people also. So let us uh, open up our texts here. And we've been talking about the Ebed Ivri, the Hebrew slave and uh, the various rules uh, about him going free after, uh, after six years. And we discussed last week the difficulty in the text about, you know, it, it sounds at times as if the family of the, uh, of the person who became a slave also become slaves themselves. We'll talk about that some more uh, in the continuation of this uh, session, but now we get to the uh, last verses in Parshat Mishpatim in Exodus chapter 21 about the male Hebrew slave. The mamor yomar ha'eved, but if the slave declares, I love my master and my wife and children, all of you know that, of course, the Hebrew word ahavti, uh, that's one of the problems in Hebrew that there's not a clear distinction between saying I like something and I love uh, love something. It's a, uh, a distinction that, the, that our, we English speakers find to be very important in language. And it's not all that clear in either biblical or uh, modern Hebrew. Uh, the, how to express that precise difference between liking and loving. But here we have, I love my master, the JPS translation. It might just mean I like my master. I like being here in this situation. And my wife and my children, I do not wish to go free. His master shall take him before, in the Hebrew, El Ha Elohim, literally before God. But the Jewish tradition has always understood that Elohim can mean um, uh, can, can mean the judges also, and that's how the Jewish tradition has always understood this text. That a ceremony takes place in front of judges. He shall brought be brought to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall then remain his slave. Let olam, and anybody who knows uh, who knows Hebrew knows that the uh, the simplest understanding of let olam is forever uh, for the rest of his life. But we will see the discussion of this uh, term before we see commentaries on this on these verses here. It is good to compare them with the two other passages in the Torah that talk about a slave ceasing to be a slave. So in Vayikra, in Leviticus chapter 15, it says, If your kinsman under you is in straits and must give himself over to you, do not subject him to the treatment of a slave. So if, if he sold himself to you, don't treat him the way you would treat a slave, even though we're calling him a, uh, an evidy free. He shall remain with you as a hired or bound laborer. Like somebody who uh, has to work for you, but he shall be treated like a, a, a worker. He shall remain with you as a hired or bound laborer. He shall serve with you only until the Jubilee year. This is, we all notice, this is different from what we saw in Shmot in Exodus that says that uh, the slave uh, is a slave until six years elapse. And then when the Jubilee year comes along, then the slave and his children, again, the simple meaning of the text seems to imply that when somebody becomes a, an Ebed Ivri, 
so do the family members of this uh, of, of this Hebrew slave. Okay, so that's the parallel passage in Vayikra. And now the parallel passage in Devarim that talks about setting free a, a slave. When you set him free, do not let him go empty handed, furnish him out of the flock, threshing floor and that with which the Lord your God has blessed you. Bear in mind that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. We talked about this already, the connection between uh, our experience as being slaves and these laws about slaves. So when you let this slave go free, you should not send the slave away empty handed. You give the slave gifts. Bear in mind that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. And uh, of course, we know the uh, story that when God redeemed us, he also gave us, uh, he, uh, he also gave us uh, gifts. The, the Egyptians gave us gifts as we left the, uh, as we left the country. Um, Therefore, I enjoin this commandment upon you today because of that experience that you had of slavery and of going free and of getting gifts when you went free. That's why you are being asked to do the same thing. And the book of Devarim goes on and says, but should he say to you, I do not want to leave you for he loves you, again, Ahivcha, uh, and your household, and is happy with you, you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door and he shall become your slave. The Hebrew here is Ebed Olam. So, so the JPS translates here, your slave in perpetuity. And then the text says, we'll get back to this, maybe not today, maybe just next week. And you can do, and, and do the same thing with your female slave. So here, uh, here the text seems to be closer to the pattern that we saw in Exodus, but it does add these various uh, gifts. And the, there's one detail that's added about the ceremony about the all, uh, taking an all and putting it, if, if you look back at the text in, uh, in Exodus, it says, the gisho el adel la mezusa veratza, Adonav et osno ba marzea, the all, the marzea is used to, to, to make a hole in his ear. And here in Devarim, there's one fact that's added that might not seem all that important, but when we look at the commentaries in the continuation, it is going to become important. It says that the marzea should be put be osno uvadelet. So it's as if, you know, here's the wall and you put the slave's ear beside the wall and then you put the all symbolically attaching momentarily, not permanently, of course, but momentarily attaching the slave's ear to the door. That, that fact has been added here and we will see it's uh, significance in the continuation. Um, so there are a number of uh, possible uh, uh, interpretive issues related to this passage here. And the first one is, of course, just simply to say, you know, like, what's the idea here uh, of, this, of this ceremony? Uh, why specifically is this ceremony, the ceremony that turns a temporary slave into a slave who is going to stay for a longer period of time. So Rashi offers a couple of really beautiful uh, explanations that uh, he, as generally happens, this is not Rashi's innovation, but he's choosing from the Midrashic literature and he finds a couple of uh, fascinating uh, Midrashim here. 
Uh, I, I love the Hebrew here of the beginning of this passage in Rashi. Mara'a ozen. What did the ears see? Uh, you know, of course, ears don't uh, see. Last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about the phrase roim uh, etakolot, seeing the uh, voices, and now we're talking about the uh, ears, uh, the, the ears seeing. But of course, uh, it just means. Why was it more appropriate for the ear to be pierced more than any other part of the body? And I, I think that, of course, the simplest answer to this question, if you're gonna pierce a part of the body, which part of the body are you going to pierce? I, I, I think that uh, you know, while piercing is done on all sorts of uh, parts of the body in, uh, in, in many different cultures, piercing the ear is the most popular way of, uh, uh, of piercing. And it's also, uh, I presume, I've never had any parts of my body pierced, but I, I, I assume that piercing the ear is, uh, is less painful and perhaps less damaging than piercing other parts of the body. But Rashi uh, uh, prefers giving a, uh, a more meaningful answer. Amar Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. So here's the explanation offered uh, by Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai back in the first uh, century. This ear should be pierced because it heard at Mount Sinai, do not steal, and the person still went and stole. Or, this ear should be pierced since it heard on Mount Sinai, the children of Israel are my, in other words, God's slaves. And this person still went out and acquired another owner. So Rashi is giving the two possibilities of how an Ebedee Vri could become an Ebedee Vri. He could become an Ebedee Vri because he stole and he could not return the, that which he stole, didn't have uh, the uh, wherewithal to uh, make recompense, so he has to work off his debt, or because he sold himself. And either way, Rashi says, uh, basing himself on uh, Midrash from back in the first century, either way, this person is becoming a perpetual slave because he didn't hear very well, because he, he should have heard various things at Mount Sinai. He should have heard that we should not be stealing. He should have heard that uh, freedom is an important value and that you should not become a slave. I would say a, uh, a meaningful midrash or two meaningful midrashim offered by Rashi. And Rashi does not uh, suffice with this. He goes on and says, and why were the door and the doorposts chosen more than any other item in the home? Why do this at the door or do it at the doorpost? God said, a person who acquires himself an owner ought to go through the piercing ceremony in front of them since they were the witnesses when I passed over the doors and doorposts and declared that the children of Israel are my slaves and not the slaves of other slaves. So the door and the doorpost are significant. Uh, we're in Exodus, we're in Exodus chapter 21, which comes just a few chapters after Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, when the Jews are about to leave Egypt and they're celebrating, uh, that they're having the first, they're having Pesach Mitzrayim, the celebration of uh, the Pesach before leaving Egypt, there's a ceremony that involves the door and the doorpost. So are you Rashi? Uh, the ear is something that should have heard about freedom. And the door and the doorpost are symbols of freedom. And so that's why this person who is giving up on his freedom, Rashi, uh, everybody I'm sure is noticing here, Rashi is seeing the text as hinting that the, that which this person uh, chose to do was not the correct choice. If you look back at the biblical verse itself, you know, I, I don't, necessarily see this here in the verse, in the shot of the verse. It doesn't explicitly say that, uh, that, that this is a bad choice that the person is making, but actually, uh, even if it isn't, uh, even if it isn't the shot, uh, sorry, even if it isn't the shot, I pushed the wrong button and uh, 
moved many uh, slides forward. Even if it isn't the pshat, it is a beautiful idea that, that freedom is a strong Jewish value and that nobody should be giving up their freedom so easily. So that's what Rashi says. And then along comes Rashi's grandson, Rashbam, and offers a very different explanation. The why is the ear pierced beside the door? So Rashbam offers two explanations. First of all, he says, his ear is pierced in full view of the public as a sign of slavery. Okay, that's a rational reason. If you, if you conduct this ceremony inside of a building, then nobody knows about it. And this, this ceremony should be performed in a way that people will know about it. And so that should be uh, near the door. And then he says, the reason the door and the doorpost specifically were chosen for this ceremony is that even in a stone house, the door and the doorpost are made of wood. So it is possible to pierce through his ear and through the door. I don't know what your reaction is when you see a comment like this of Rashbam. I'm sure that many of you know that I, uh, I'm a big fan of Rashbam's uh, Torah commentary, but there's something pretty deflating about this explanation, something very prosaic about this explanation. Rashbam says, houses are made out of stone. It said there in Devarim that you're supposed to take the awl and you're supposed to put the awl through his ear, attaching his ear to the house. But natata beosno uvadelet. If it said, well, you can't get a marzea, you can't get an awl to penetrate into the stone of the house. And that's why it says to do it at the, uh, at, at the door. Uh, I hope Rashbam will forgive me for saying this, but I think Rashbam sounds a little bit like a professor in the university when he offers an explanation like this. It's like he's saying, oh, in those days, <coughs> all the houses were made out of stone. And so if you wish to have a ceremony attaching the uh, ear of the, uh, of the slave to the house, you have to, uh, you have to do it at the door, which is made out of wood, or the doorpost that's made out of wood, but you can't do it at the, uh, at the house. Does Rashbam not know the beautiful Nidrash that Rashi quoted? Of course he knows this. It was his grandson that everybody knew Rashi's commentary. He studied this, I'm sure, from the time that he was a little kid. He knew this explanation, and he's... I, as he often does, he purposely offers a... Uh, what I would call a deflating and prosaic explanation of the text, that there's a simpler reading. It's as if he might be saying here, you know, this is well and good what Rashi is reading into the text, but this isn't the pshat, that Rashi is, uh, is expressing a beautiful idea here, but uh, on the simple level of understanding what's going on here. The door and the doorposts were chosen because they were made out of wood. Okay, so that's the first kind of surprising explanation that Rashbam gives here about the text. Uh, yes, so someone, uh, Annie asks, how do you detach the ear from the door after the ceremony? Presumably you just pull the all out, the all temporarily goes through the, uh, uh, through the ear and into the door, and then you pull the all out. I hope you don't hurt the, the uh, slave too much by doing that, but uh, I, I assume that that's, uh, that that's what happens. Um, so that's the first surprising aspect of Rashbam's commentary on this uh, verse. The next surprising aspect of Rashbam's commentary on this verse is Rashi says, olam. Rashi says, this means until the Jubilee. Now, of course, the word la'olam, the simple meaning of the word la'olam is forever. 
But Rashi says this means until the Jubilee year. Why does Rashi say this? Because, of course, because Rashi does not want there to be a contradiction between what it says here in Shmot and what it said in Vayikra. In Vayikra, it said that the, uh, the, the slave uh, goes free at the Jubilee year. So Rashi uh, harmonizes by saying that Le'olam means until the Jubilee year. Uh, there's some uh, noise in somebody's, uh, if, uh, if people could, uh, could mute themselves or cheer up, you could uh, try muting uh, the, so, so Rashi. Everybody, Dr. Rakshin, you'll have to mute, unmute yourself again, okay? Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. Uh, so Rashi, understandably, abandons the simple understanding of the word le'olam in order uh, uh, in, in order to uh, in order not to have a contradiction between Exodus and uh, Leviticus. Rashbam just writes le'olam l'fi hapshat kol yamei chayav in the book of Samuel, it says when uh, Hannah says that she's willing to dedicate uh, her son to God, and when she says, uh, he will, uh, I'll bring him to the temple, the Yashav Sham Ad Olam, we understand that as meaning he must remain there for good. And... That's what the word means here. So Rashbam is, you know, he's like the, uh, in some ways he's like the, uh, the uh, little boy in the, uh, in the emperor's new clothes. He says, you know, saying, you know, that's not what the word means. You know, the word. So how does Rashbam relate to the fact that the explanation that he is offering is different from the explanation uh, that that uh, that the halacha has, and that it, it, it's saying that there's a contradiction here between what it says in Exodus and what it says in Bayikra. Okay, well, uh, I I'd like to be able to say we will solve this problem very soon, but I'm not sure we're going to solve the problem. But we will see people talking about this problem. So, in the 18th century, Moses Mendelssohn wrote a commentary on the uh, Torah, and here's a section from the introduction to his Torah commentary. I'm sure that everybody here know, has heard of Moses Mendelssohn, one of the leaders of the Haskalah, um, and many people uh, incorrectly say that Moses Mendelssohn was the first reformed Jew. There's no, actually no, no truth to that. Uh, and the reform movement did not really uh, exist uh, through, uh, through, through Mendelssohn's uh, life, except perhaps in the uh, last years of his life, some beginnings of things that might be leading to the, uh, leading to the, ref the reform movement. Uh, but Mendelssohn wrote an extremely from and an extremely religious commentary on the Torah. He wrote it with various uh, help, uh, helpers. He writes here in the introduction, he had hired his friend, Rabbi Solomon Dobno, to write the commentary. Mendelssohn wrote the translation of the Bible into, uh, into German. And then uh, Dobno uh, 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 wrote the commentary on Genesis, and then Dubno and Mendelssohn had a falling out after the Genesis volume came out, and Mendelssohn wrote himself the commentary on Exodus, and we'll see that commentary on Exodus in a second, but uh, before we look at that, let's take a look at what Mendelssohn writes in the introduction to his Torah commentary. 
You know, I asked Rabbi Solomon Dubno to uh, write the commentary, and he did as I instructed him. He gathered together the chat explanations of scriptures from the works of the earliest practitioners of Pshat exegesis. From the works of the great luminary Rashi, who, when he offers a Pshat explanation, has no equal. So, uh, so, uh, Dubno used Rashi's commentary, especially when Rashi offers a Pshat explanation, and Mendelssohn gives Rashi this like uh, compliment here. When Rashi tries to do Pshat, he has no equal, implying that Rashi is not always trying to do Pshat, as we know very well from things that we, uh, that we saw in previous uh, sessions, and I'm sure that you all know that anyways. And from the works of his grandson, Rashbam, who delved into the pshat meaning of the text deeply, in fact, sometimes more than is appropriate. Let's look at the Hebrew of that text. Rashbam was more interested in pshat than a Jew really ought to be. So much so that it happens that due to his great love of pshat, he occasionally misses the truth. Ad shel ahavat hapshat unotel lifamim min nekudat haemet. It's a fascinating thing. Rashbam, who is one of the Balei Atosafot, he's Rashi's grandson. He's dedicating most of his life, I think, to the study of Talmud and Halacha, uh, and, and a, a very pious medieval rabbi is being criticized by Moses Mendelssohn, the Moskil, the enlightened Jew of the 18th century for relying on pshat too much. And sometimes pshat, Mendelssohn says, will lead you away from the truth. And then Mendelssohn goes on in his, uh, in, in his commentary here, and he, say, he, and he talks about other sources that Dubno used. And the only person that he criticizes at all is Rashbam. Uh, I just remind people uh, or tell people who didn't uh, know this, Rashbam's commentary was lost for a while and was only published for the first time in the 18th century. And in Enlightenment circles, when it was published, it made a big splash. And people were all excited about this. And Moses Mendelssohn himself was pretty excited about the publication of Rashbam's commentary on the Torah, but he had his problems with Rashbam's commentary on the Torah, uh, as he will explain. Mendelssohn makes it clearer here. This is in his introduction to the Torah commentary, but then he gets, this is Mendelssohn's introduction to Mishpatim. So before his commentary on our, on our Parsha in uh, Exodus 21, uh, Mendelssohn has a long introduction should tell you that uh, I uh, made great use of the uh, volume, uh, Mendelssohn's Hebrew Writing by uh, Eddie Breuer, who a number of you Torontonians uh, might know, and some of you Jerusalemites might also know, a former uh, Torontonian, former Montrealer, then a former Torontonian, and now a, uh, and now a scholar who lives here in Jerusalem, and. Uh, Eddie Breuer, together with uh, uh, David Serkin, uh, published an English translation of Mendelssohn's Hebrew writings. And uh, I, I based what I have here on, uh, on their translation. Rashbam began his commentary on this profound and wide-reaching chapter by writing, let those who love wisdom know and understand that my purpose, as I explained in Genesis, is not to offer halachic interpretations, even though such interpretations are the most essential ones. And some of those explanations can be found in the works of my mother's father, Rashi. So Rashbam knows that he's going to be shocking people by offering explanations that differ from the halakhic understanding. And so he writes here uh, that, uh, that the, he apologizes ahead of time. This is not going to be a halakhic commentary. And he goes on and says, 
This is still Mendelssohn quoting Rashbam. But my purpose is to explain the plain meaning of scripture. Some of you might recognize that that's very close to the language that Rashi uses about himself. Uh, and uh, Rashbam says, I'm actually the one who's offering the Pshat explanation of the text. I will explain the laws and the rules of the Torah in a manner that conforms to the natural way of the world. It's hard to translate this phrase here. It might just mean like, the way that you read a text, that I will use the standard text reading skills that people have in order to read this text. Nevertheless, it is the halakhic level of interpretation that is the most essential one. So uh, Rashbam says, I'm gonna be offering an explanation of this text that is not the halachic explanation of the text. And don't worry, I accept halacha. I mean, I'm, I'm not a rebel against halacha and you should, uh, it, 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 you should understand my commentary here in this, uh, in this framework. And then Mendelssohn says, we too, will hover under the weepings of the great eagle. I think this is the only time I've seen somebody referring to, uh, to Rashbam as Hanesher Hagadol. That's a phrase that's very often used about uh, Rambam, but uh, Mendelssohn uses it here about Rashbam. We too will hover under the weakness of the great eagle and we will not depart from the plain meaning of scripture to the right or to the left. We will be dedicated, our whole project here uh, in this commentary is dedicated to Pshat, but we have not forgotten the principle which we laid down in the introduction to this work about the difference between contradictory explanations and differing explanations. Al-davar ha-hevdel ben ha-soter lamit chalif. He will explain. It is acceptable for the Pshat to differ from the traditions of the rabbis, but it cannot contradict the rabbis in halakha or law. It is still possible for differing explanations to both be true. You can have two explanations of the same text and they could both be true. They don't, if, you know, lo tochlu al hadam, do not eat on the blood, could be a reference to some kind of magical ceremony, and it could be a reference to eating blood, and both of those could be true. Those, both of them could be, we believe, Judaism believes in a multivalent text, in a text that has more than one understanding. And so you can have two explanations that differ from, uh, from each other. You have a verse that says, uh, uh, that says, Lifne uh, Iver, Lo Titain uh Last week's parsha for those of you who were in uh, who were in Chutz Laaretz, and a week and a half ago for those of you who were here in Israel, do not put a stumbling block before the blind, and that could mean. You see a blind person coming along, don't put uh, uh, something in front of them that's going to cause them to fall down. And it could mean what the rabbis say, that it means that you shouldn't give advice to somebody that will mislead them. That if somebody is uh, 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 if somebody has, has a, a blindness about something, you shouldn't, uh, uh, you shouldn't mislead them. And both of those things, both of those could be true. There's no, con uh, those things do not, they, these are explanations that differ from each other. They don't contradict each other. And as I said, if you believe in a multivalent text and a text that has more than one meaning, then there's nothing, pro uh, no problem in saying that those two meanings are true. It is still possible for differing explanations to both be true, but with contradictory explanations, if one is true, the second one is certainly false. And if, Va'avado the olam really means to go free in the jubilee year, uh, and and Rashbam says that it means he stays a slave forever. Well, they can't both be true. 
Either he goes free in the Jubilee year or he stays a slave forever. And so that's the problem that Mendelssohn has with Rushbaum. And so Mendelssohn explains to us his methodology as a Bible commentator. So whenever uncovering the shot of scripture contradicts the tradition of the rabbis in halacha or law, the commentator must totally abandon the shot and follow tradition, or if possible, explain how the two explanations can, can be reconciled. If you come up with a reconciliation that la'olam means la'olam, it means forever and it also means to the jubilee year, matov, that's, that's fine. But if you, if you can't reconcile the two, you have to choose tradition. It's uh, so uh, ironic to me that Moses Mendelssohn, the Moscow, is the uh, is the big defender here of tradition and is criticizing Rashbam for uh, uh, for not defending, not being loyal enough to tradition. We have made this the guiding principle of our commentary, and we will keep to it with God's help. And so that's, Mendelssohn writes that in the beginning of Mishpatim, he, he, he's well acquainted with Rashbam's introduction to Mishpatim, where Rashbam says, I'm going to be offering a level of interpretation that is not the halachic level of interpretation. And Mendelssohn says, whoa, don't do that if it's going to contradict the halacha. If it differs from halacha, fine, but if it contradicts it, then don't do it. And so what does Mendelssohn do when he gets to our verse here, va'avado olam? He writes, olam here means until the time of the Jubilee year. There is no longer period of time in the Jewish calendar. So it is a... Uh, it's a period of time. Oh, the, the beginning of this con. We know that in biblical Hebrew, olam refers to time. Olam in uh, spoken modern Hebrew generally refers to the world. It refers to a place. But uh, uh, Mendelssohn correctly writes that olam in biblical Hebrew is a reference to something about time. And so le olam means for a time, So, but the longest unit of time that the Bible recognizes is the jubilee year. And so le olam means until that longest unit of time is completed until the jubilee year. And therefore, we have no contradiction between Exodus and Leviticus. There's no longer period of time in the Jewish calendar. Furthermore, and if you don't like that one, I'll give you another one. When the slave goes free, it is as if his world has been renewed. And so that's actually giving the later Hebrew understanding of olam. Ke'ilu olam mitchadesh lo. So that's a olam he will serve until it's the time for his, for his world to be renewed. Uh, these don't look like shot explanations of the text, but, uh, but Mendelssohn makes it very clear why he is offering these explanations, because he does not want there to be a contradiction between what it says here in Exodus and what it says in Leviticus. Uh, and actually, just to point out, Mendelssohn just took this as he says that he's going to do this, that he's going to collect from the works of the uh, of the Pshat commentators, and it's from Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra was the first one who made this attempted reconciliation. Ibn Ezra was a big one at reconciling and not having there be a contradiction between the Pshat level of interpretation and the Halachic level of interpretation. So Ibn Ezra seeing here that the Halacha says that a slave goes free in the Jubilee year and that but Yikra says, and Leviticus says that a slave goes free in the in the Jubilee year. Even Ezra offers this, offered that uh, harmonization that we just saw in Mendelssohn. We know that the Hebrew word lo'olam refers to time, but but lo'olam likewise means he will serve him until the year of the Jubilee, for there's no season of Israel that's longer than it. Going free is comparable to a renewal of the world. It is also possible that it mean, its meaning is that he should be as he was in former times. Uh, Mendelssohn, I guess, didn't like that last uh, suggestion made by Ibn Ezra, and he quotes only the uh, only the first explanations offered by uh, by Ibn Ezra. Um, 
How did Rashbam deal with the contradiction? We don't know. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the big riddle about Rashbam's commentary on the Torah that I've been thinking about for, uh, for 40 years now, and I, I don't really have a solution. Somebody suggested in the, in the chat a few weeks ago that, that these days we recognize the possibility that a text might have more than one level of meaning and those levels of meaning might, uh, 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 might contradict each other. It might not be the same as each other. They, they might be, Irrecon irreconcilable with each other. Uh, perhaps a postmodern uh, approach to the interpretation of texts can tolerate something like this. Could Rashbam have had this kind of postmodern understanding of uh, of how um, uh, uh, of how to offer interpretations of a text that contradict each other? Maybe, uh, but I don't know. But in the 19th century, we find, so we, we find in the 18th century, we find Mendelssohn criticizing Rushbaum for offering an explanation like this. In the 19th century, we find Shadal trying to show that Rushbaum could be right and dealing with the contradiction that that creates between Exodus and Leviticus. So Shadal, Samuel David Buzzato in the 19th century, teaching in the modern Orthodox rabbinical seminary in Padua writes, he will serve him the olam literally, but afterward, the law of the Jubilee was promulgated and partly canceled out what was said before. This is really a fascinating theory of Shadal's, but you know, when you think about it, it might sound radical to you at first thought, but let's think about it a little bit and discuss just how radical, uh, just how radical it is. So Shadal is saying that this is the first law code that we are reading right after the Exodus from Egypt, and that there was a process of revelation that went on during all of the years that the Israelites were in the, uh, in the desert. And the laws of the Jubilee year were given later on. They are mentioned later on in the Bible. And here at this point in Exodus, the text says, that a slave who doesn't want to go free after six years can become a slave forever, le'olam. And then a new law was promulgated later on about the Jubilee, which partly canceled out what was said before. Uh, uh, just a, a week or two ago, I read in draft a, uh, an article by another uh, scholar who uh, was discussing the question of how did people understand what it meant to say uh, that, uh, that Moses wrote the Torah. And it's interesting to find that among medieval rabbis, there were different understandings of just those simple words, Moses wrote the Torah. Does it mean that he wrote the entire Torah at Har Sinai, or does it mean that he composed the Torah in a process that went on for many years as they went through the desert? And clearly, Shadal is on the side that the Torah is, is revealed to Moshe a bit at a time. Here we have the first law code right after the Ten Commandments. And the general rabbinic reaction is to try to say, well, clearly there can't be a contradiction between Leviticus and Exodus. And Shadal says, well, actually there can be. 
because there's a, uh, uh, my neighbor here in, uh, here in Jerusalem, uh, Professor Tamar Roth has written about this, uh, this idea of a progressive kind of, uh, uh, of revelation. And, and, and Shadal is, uh, is interpreting this progressive kind of revelation to the Torah. That the Torah began in the first law code by saying that a slave like this would be a slave forever. And then when the law of the Jubilee was given to Moshe, then they said, oh, but when the Jubilee comes along, that, of course, will free any slave. Uh, and Shadal continues here. Here, there is no mention at all of the Jubilee, which was promulgated subsequently in Leviticus 25. For those of you here in Israel, you'll hear that in Shul this week. There it states, and he shall serve with you until the year of the Jubilee, and then he will leave your house together with his children. After the law of the Jubilee was given, it canceled to some degree the law that preceded it. And thus, if the Jubilee intervened within a six-year term, the servant went free in that year. Nevertheless, the law of six years was not canceled. It, it, it's not as if the laws of Exodus became uh, uh, it became uh, null and void. The idea of six years is still a principle when you get to Leviticus, but there are two exceptions to it. First of all, if the Jubilee comes during those six years, then uh, the, the slave will go free in the Jubilee. And further, the statement, and he will serve with you until the year of the Jubilee, refers only to a servant whose ear has been pierced because he did not want to go free after six years, but it encompasses also a rule that if the Jubilee intervened within a regular servant six years, he would go free. So that's how Shatal comes up with a way of understanding a historical development here. The original law promulgated said, that a slave serves for six years. Then at a later stage of revelation, the Jubilee laws were given and they modify the laws of Exodus in two ways. First of all, if the Jubilee year comes before the six years. And second of all, even though Exodus had said, well, if you decide that you want to stay a slave after the six years, you can go through the ceremony. You can stay a uh, you can say a slave let olam forever. Then along came Vayikra in this process of uh, of uh, progressive revelation and revealed a new law that that said, well, actually, that le olam only means until the jubilee year. Considering the life expectancy back in uh, in that society, that might mean that a lot of the uh, the abadim near saim of the slaves who go through a ceremony like this with the piercing of their ear, they might just end up being slaves le olam forever. But if the jubilee year comes. Before, uh, before they die, then they would go free uh, during the Jubilee year. Is it possible that Rashbam also would subscribe to this kind of idea of how to reconcile the, uh, these laws? I doubt it. I can't prove that he didn't. And as I said, I don't really have a, uh, a final answer of how Rashbam, uh, this truly uh, committed halachic Jew, who certainly accepts the halachic interpretation and who certainly uh, accepts the idea that, he, that he's, if you came up to Rashbam and said, do Exodus and, uh, and uh, Leviticus contradict each other? We say, God forbid, you know, they're the word of God. But here he's interpreting them in such a way that they do, uh, that they do contradict uh, each other. Um, okay, I think that we are going to stop here we've got 10 minutes left i'll take a look at the chat and if people who who wish to uh unmute themselves and ask uh, oral questions you know, feel free uh, to do that but first i'll take a uh, take a look at the 
chat. How would Mendelssohn explain the pasuk at the end of Shiratayam, Hashem yimloch olam va'ed, if olam is always limited by time? Great question, Marty. Uh, all I can say is that maybe he would say that that va'ed makes it forever. Um, I'm, I'm sure that Mendelssohn realized that he was li- uh, that he was offering a uh, a far fetched explanation, um, but he he felt that he's uh, that he has to uh, do that. Uh, yes. Gershon says, perhaps uh, I should say that uh, Mendelssohn had problems with the way Maskillam justified their extrapolations by mistakenly claiming that they followed the methodology of, uh, of Rashbam. Probably, uh, because Mendelssohn was not one of the, uh, of the more radical uh, uh, Maskilim, and I think... Uh, I think that Gershon is right about that, that, that Mendelssohn was... Per- perturbed when he saw how other Muskilim were uh, uh, quoting Rashbam with a wink and and, and he found uh, he, he probably found them to be more dangerous than he found Rashbam to be. Um, the great Talmudist at the Hebrew University, Professor Ephraim Urbach uh, of Blessed Memory, once wrote an article uh, about Rashbam, and he said in the article that he doesn't really believe that Rashbam would have offered interpretations like he offered if he had lived in the uh, 18th, 19th, or 20th, uh, uh, 20th centuries. Um, yes. Marty. Uh, yes. What was the relationship between Rushbum and Rushi? It almost seems like he wants to up his grandfather one. Uh, it, it, it does seem to be this kind of uh, love-hate uh, 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 relationship. Uh, you know, there are so many passages in which Rushbum writes uh, writes complimentary things about Rashi, and he's also very dependent on uh, on on Rashi. Uh, in, in, in many of the things that he writes, particularly in his Talmud commentary. And then at times he just like goes ballistic against what, uh, against what Rashi uh, says. Um, I once asked a, uh, a psychiatrist uh, that I know <laughs> and respect if he had ever encountered this, you know, the, you know, in relationships between sons and fathers, you can find uh, relationships like this, where the son has uh, uh, respect for the father, but every once in a while, it just I can't can't take it what my uh, what my father is uh, is saying here. Uh, I asked the psychiatrist, whom I know and respect, whether he had ever seen a relationship like that between a grandson and a grandfather, and he said no. <laughs> he had never in, in his all, all the forty years of practice, he had never seen a. Problem. How long did their lives were they alive at the same time? Like how long did they know each other? Okay, so uh, Rashi died in 1105. Uh, he lived from 1040 to 1105. Uh, uh, pardon me for telling this joke. A lot of you have heard me telling this joke before, but I remember the years that Rashi lived by remembering the joke about the uh, professor at Yeshiva University who told his stu- students that Rashi lived from 1040 to 1105. And one of the students uh, allegedly said, it's amazing what he accomplished in 25 minutes. Uh, so, so that helps you remember the years that uh, that Rashi lived. Uh, you can remember that uh, joke about twenty five minutes, and we have no idea when Rashbam was born. Now we know that he was Rashi's oldest grandson, and so it was kind of assumed that it's unlikely that he was born before ten eighty. But then uh, Professor Yisrael Tashma here from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem said, why are people making an assumption like that, that uh, somebody could only become a grandfather at age 40 uh, and people got married young? 
in those days. We'll talk about that actually next week. The uh, the, the idea of people getting married uh, getting married young, uh, and, and so maybe he was born before 1080. But uh, the most common scholarly guess is that he was born somewhere around 1080, meaning that Rashbam had a relationship with his grandfather for 25 years, and in many ways he was Rashi's Talmid Mufak. He was his leading student. And again, Professor Ephraim Orbach of the Hebrew University says that when Rashi died, Rashbam took over the yeshiva there in Tra for a uh, short period of time until Rashbam's younger brother, uh, Rabbeinu Tam, Rabbi Jacob Tam, uh, became, the, uh, became the, Rosh, the Rosh yeshiva. Um, but so, so the simplest answer is, the best guess is, that uh, Rashi's uh, uh, life and Rashbam's life overlapped with each other for 25 years. And we have evidence from outside of Rashi and Rashbam's work from a rabbi called Rav Yitzhak Or who was a little younger than uh, Rashbam, who talks about the fact that Rashi used to quote various verses and call them Psuke de Shmuel. These are the verses that Shmuel, my grandson Shm uh, Shmulek, uh, <laughs> taught me about uh, these verses. And uh, I, I, I think that there's reasonable evidence that Rashi and Rashbam uh, you know, conversed with each other and that Rashi was willing to learn from uh, from his grandson, although most of the learning presumably went in the of course from the direction of the grandfather to the grandson. Uh, yes, we write. Uh, why not just say that pure steers have a long tradition in many cultures? I totally I agree. Uh, and he writes, "How do you attach?" Oh yes, we related to that. <laughs> The Hebrew word ahav means both like and love, like the Hebrew word evet can mean both servant and slave. Good point, Naomi. Uh, okay. Any other uh, yeah. last questions? Could I, could I say Mark, something? Mark, Please. But here, one more question. Aren't you, aren't you for to, 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 to adopt a, a, progressive view of the way of the Torah just because so much of the Torah happened after her season and at the end of Vayikra it says Baha and then and so more than a cheaper how and what happened in Midbar? Good question. Very good question, Marty. You are right that the beginning of that section in Bayikra begins by the Barashel Moshe Bahar Sinai Lemor, as we read here on uh, on Monday morning, as we'll read here tomorrow morning here uh, here in Israel. It says that it's Bahar Sinai. Uh, I guess that you can say that, you know, they stayed there for a while. And the question is whether the text is trying to suggest that uh, Moshe got the entire Torah at Har Sinai in one, uh, in one sitting, or it could be that it was a, uh, you know, uh, uh, Shadal prefers the idea of saying that it was a, uh, a process. There was one other person who wanted to ask a question, a woman's voice. I couldn't tell who it was. Uh, I could just um, interject one thing. This is Isser, sure. Isser speaking from New York. Hello, just to Isser. elaborate on the Bahar, I, I just took a look in the uh, stone Chumash at the beginning of Parashat Bahar, just one short, uh, very short mm -hmm. paragraph. On Bahar Sinai, he says, what is the connection between Shemitah and Mount Sinai? This reference teaches that not only the broad outlines, but the details of all the commandments that were given at Sinai, as were those of Shemitah, even the commandments that the Torah recorded many years after the revelation at Sinai. The otherwise superfluous Bahar Sinai is meant to indicate that all the commandments are of Sinaitic 
origin as well. So mm-hmm. it's very hard to ad- adapt Shadal's uh, approach if you accept this. this if, is Rashi. You accept, if you accept this, uh, yes, that is right. And it's not clear, you know, that, that is Rashi's approach. And that's- From the that, Sifra, that, from the Sifra. Yes, the, if, yes, Rashi from the Midrash is saying this. However, there are other traditions in the rabbinic literature about the uh, about the Torah being given migilot migilot, section by section, and uh, that the general principles were given at Har Sinai, and then the, the details were given in the following years. And uh, presumably, Shadal would be more comfortable with that. Uh, uh, with that approach, but you're right. This approach that is uh, the one that became famous through uh, through Rashi uh, is uh, it contradicts what uh, what Shadal said. Or uh, yes, Shadal could not say this if he uh, if he accepted what Rashi said. Okay, I see a uh, lawyer has said that uh, she will use what she learned today for a presentation in court regarding contradictory evidence. Great, I'm glad <laughs> that you find uh, usefulness of this in another setting. Okay, I'll see you all uh, next week. Wonderful learning with you all and uh, have a good day.